figure this out. Okay. One second. Okay. All right. Good morning. Sorry for the delay. Just uh, having some technical barriers. Just want to. I think we got everybody ready here we need. Okay. So I thought today we would do Life of the Fellow on Call, which is also uh, subtitled Text Messages I Have Received in the Last Two or Three Years. So, okay, let's move on here. All right, uh, Sergey, uh, you are on the line. Uh, if you saw this ECG, how would you describe this ECG? Um, to... Good morning. Good morning. Um, I see some grouping. Um, and uh, I would describe it in the following way. So um, irregular rhythm, narrow complex. I um, checking whether there are P waves before the QRSs. Um, so I see some P waves, but they are not the same. Um, and um, I believe there is some uh, active P, atrial active P. So I see a P wave. If I look at the V1, <clears throat> I see a P wave and a QRS, then a different kind of P wave and a QRS, then a pause. So I think that this is a uh, premature, maybe atrial contraction that was conducted. And there is a pause and then regular P wave, um, regular P wave and then another. Um, so I would call it a atrial trigemini. That is correct. This is uh, some sort of atrial trigemini. Do you want to hazard a guess as to where this focus might be coming from? So if we look at the axis of the P wave, um, it looks like that it's, um, one second, it's positive in one, it's negative in two and three. So I would say lower right atrium. That's right. It's probably coming somewhere in the low atrium right, because it's, uh, in, it's inverted P wave in the inferior leads. So therefore we would anticipate that it's coming somewhere low in the right atrium, moving away from that area, hence a negative P wave in that region. So yes, yeah, so you would describe this as uh, atrial trigemini. Is there anything else unusual about this uh, tracing? Mm. Would that be a full description of the ECG? What about the the rate, the axis, all of that right. stuff? Um, well, the the rate, I um... rate's hard to describe because right. it's irregular, right? Because it's irregular. <laughs> um, the axis is um, it's negative in one and uh, positive in AVF. Um, so it's uh, right axis deviation. Mm -hmm. um, and then the P waves are, I don't well, see the any P signs. P waves you, you sort of already described. Right. right, I mean, I don't see any signs of uh, right or left atrium enlargement. Right. Um, the um, PR interval is, it looks like it's within 120 milliseconds, or maybe two, three, four, maybe it's a little bit longer actually. In, uh, but still it's acceptable, I would say. How old is this patient? I don't recall. I believe it's a baby actually. Um, Less than a year of age, let's say. QRS is narrow. Mm -hmm. One, two. Yeah, um, okay. and then uh, QT interval is um, QDC. Well, it's normal, right? It's not QT the one. It's, is it's yeah, roughly less than half of RR. 
Okay. Right. You can measure it though too. Okay. Let's move on to our next one. Good job. This is a text I received from Dr. Obiaka. I'm sure it was sent two or three hours before I received it, Uzo. Uh, this is an eight-day-old full-term female in the NICU with a new diagnosis of ORT. This is the exact words of Uzo. Admitted to the NICU for respiratory distress, noted to have tachycardia, asked to review the telly, which shows two episodes for SVT, heart rate 300, a few seconds terminated spontaneously associated with desaturation to the 80s, no blood pressure checks during the episodes, hemodynamically stable, would like to start propranolol at two per kilo per day to in Q8 dosing, if okay with you. So, do you agree with Uzoma? Let me see uh, if uh, Dr. Neha Lawali is on the line. Do you agree with Chief Uzo in her diagnosis? She says it's a new diagnosis of ORT. And do you agree with her approach? Uh, hi, Dr. Pass. Hello. So um, eight day old with this rate um, of, with this heart rate, um, I would assume it would be, my guess would be it's likely um, ORT. And um, now, why do you say that? Why would it be o ORT? Yeah, I'm just so, asking for general principle oh, question. So, for uh, newborns and infants, the most likely cause of tachyarrhythmia uh, would be AVRT or ORT. Um, That's true. About rough, what percentage roughly? Um, 80, 70, 80%. Something so, like that. That's probably right. Okay. What's um, the next most common? After ORT, um, atrial tachycardia? No, it's AVNRT. AVNRT. Right. And then what's the third most common? Um, is that atrial tachycardia? Atrial flutter. Yeah, atrial, atrial flutter, flutter yeah. right? We're talking about a yeah. newborn, so actually eight days old. So. Mm -hmm. Isn't that a nice picture I have of Uso in my phone here? <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, um, so, um, so this is the tracing. This is the data that Dr. Obiaka has provided you. This was all the data that I had. Right, um, so this looks narrow complex and uh, the heart rate 300 is she had said, and then it breaks um, in the middle or towards the end of the page. And the QRS complex looks similar to that, but you see um, in some you see P waves, although it's hard for to tell access on the telly. Um, um, I would say it could be um, ORT and I would, um, uh, and I think I would agree with starting propranolol. Right. So, you know, the question is, can we tell from looking at this tracing if this is truly ORT or AVNRT? The first answer is no, we can't. We can pretty much rule out atrial flutter, right? Right. What's the heart rate normally when someone has atrial flutter in a newborn period? What's the ventricular rate typically in those circumstances? Uh, between 150 to 200. Like usually closer to 200. 200, yeah. Right? And so it's this two is to a one little, block usually. Sorry. Right. So this is a little too fast or even three to one because remember the atrial rates can be as fast as 600 in a, in a newborn in atrial flutter. But this is um, notably fast. So 300 is certainly more consistent with ORT or AVNRT, and uh, how would we normally make that distinction between the two? So um, based on a 12 lead EKG, if you can see um, retrograde P waves, um, usually if you see P waves, that means it's a longish RP interval and it's likely ORT or AVRT um, as compared and to, yeah. 
uh, what is that RP? You said a longish RP. What number are you thinking of? It's more than 50 milliseconds, 70 milliseconds. 70. 70. 70 is the mm -hmm. 70 is the line in the sand. Mm -hmm. um, so now the question is, can we see retrograde P waves? And it's hard to know for sure. I think you might be able to convince yourself that the T wave is a little bit more pointy than in the sinus beats, although it's a little bit hard to tell. So I think the answer is that I would agree with Uzoma, but I'm not 100% sure both of us are right that it's ORT. Um, now, uh, what is the starting dose of propranolol for an infant with SVT? We can start with um, even lower than that, like one mix per K per day. Yeah, I think. Um, yeah, I think one to two per kilo would be a reasonable starting dose. And how frequently, Dr. Obiaka recommended Q8 dosing. Uh, is that okay with you, she's asking? What do you <laughs> think about that? I think to start with, it's okay if you're having more, if you want to make it more frequent, we could also do Q6. Um, right, so the question I'm asking is really, the pharmacokinetics, and it turns out that really it needs, it's supposed to be dosed Q6 because of the half-life in, in babies. However, because of our recognition of how difficult it is to give this medicine Q6 or any medicine Q6, it's fairly traditional to give it Q8, understanding that we will not be as well protected towards the end of each dosing eight-hour interval. So yes, we would do that normally. Okay, let's say that there is a, a national shortage of propranolol. So what would you use then, Neha? Um, I could go old school and try digoxin also. Yeah. How much digoxin would you put the baby on? Uh, I don't remember, but is it five mix per kg? Like not loading, but just um, starting them on it. Did um, you say five milligrams per kilogram? micrograms per kilogram. Yes, so, so usually in a full-term baby, you can go as high as 10 mics per kilo per day divided BID. Mm -hmm. um, some, some references would say should, go, should start at eight. Um, and in a premature infant that's substantially lower, it could be like four or five mics per kilo per day. Um, okay, uh, let's say you don't have that. What else could you use? <laughs> um, we can use um, amiodarone. No, it's right. not. A lot of countries use it as their first line agent because it's uh, relatively inexpensive. And it's uh, how often do you have to give amiodarone each day? Uh, if we do a loading, then it's twice a day, and then maintenance would be daily, once daily. Okay, so what's the half life of amiodarone? <clears throat> very, very long, like 50 days. Yeah, it's about 45 days. Uh, so why do we load it twice a day if the half-life is 50 days or 45 days? To get a steady state first to start with. Yeah, but you could give a big ass, you could give a big dose once a day, right? I mean, the reason is it can cause nausea in patients. So usually we divide oh. it up twice a day to try and prevent vomiting and stuff like that. Um, mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah, you can give amio, you can really give anything, right? You can give sodalol, you can give, uh, flecainide, um, there's a lot of different agents. What do you think about verapamil for this patient? So for newborns, we try to avoid, um, calcium channel blockers. Um, that's so right, you know, because that's they can cause cardiovascular collapse and, uh, probably overstated, but not to be done. Okay. Good job. All right, so we are in agreement with Uzoma, as we should be. Okay, here is a uh, comment from, uh, this is little Grace here, nice picture I have of her. Hi, Dr. Pass, has been text so-and-so, has been tachycardic to 190s since 11 p.m. He's been hemodynamically stable. We were able to get an EKG, and I'll show you them in a moment. The second one is an atrial EKG with V1 and V5 on the atrial wire. It looks like the P wave may be immediately after the QRS, making this AVNRT, though I'm not entirely sure I see the atrial spike. 
we increased the esmolol. We're correcting electrolytes. We're wondering if you had any thoughts. So let's look at this tracer. So this is the uh, initial tracing that uh, Grace was kind enough to send to me. And to make it easier for you, I will show you the um, AWIRE tracing. So Dr. Kong asked if this was possibly AVNRT. Um, so why don't I ask Dr. Kong's close associate, Perna Bonsal, if she has any thoughts on uh, whether she agrees with her dear friend, who she will always be tied to for her entire lifetime, Grace Kong. Good morning, Dr. Fass. Good morning, Perna. <laughs> Do you agree with your dear friend, Grace Kong, that this could be AVNRT? Um, as Grace mentioned that the spike uh, V1, I mean, in V5, I don't see, but in V1, there are like, I'm not very convinced if the the spike right before QRS is, is a P wave. Well, the uh, one thing I, before we go any further, I know she said she put it on V2 and V5, uh, V1 and V5. V5 right. But if you look, V2 clearly looks different, doesn't it? Yeah, that's true too. That looks to me like an A-wire tracing. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So I think this is actually, uh, you know, this was so, the middle of the night, and although Grace is virtually always correct, <laughs> I think in this particular case, this was a typo. Also, I'm sure that this, this may not even have been Grace who did it, right? This could have been the physician assistant at night and sending mm -hmm. it to Grace. So mm -hmm. we will not impugn Grace. So, but let's, uh, looking at V2, do you think that this is so, likely to be um, AVNRT as she has suggested the possibility? So I feel the PR, uh, the RP interval is not constant here. If you if I see the bigger spikes, if I consider them P waves, then it's it's like um, all over the place. Sometimes it's before the QRS, and sometimes it's after. And which rate is faster, the ventricular rate or the atrial spike rate? The atrial rate. Just give me one moment. Sure. Uh, I think it's the atrial rate that's uh, counting. No, I think it's actually it's ever so slightly atrial. slower. Yeah. It's very close to each other, so I would say... They are very close, I agree. But I think that the R to R interval is ever so slightly shorter than the P to P mm -hmm. interval. I so, agree with you because the RR interval is like close to eight or nine small boxes. Uh -huh. And then this is like about 10 boxes, atrial okay. spike. Yeah. I'm not sure if I can call it AVNRT, honestly, Dr. Pest. Okay. <laughs> because I'm not sure of the AVRP interval. So this would be one of those rare moments when you're not agreeing with Dr. <laughs> Kong. So, um, so we have more ventricular beats than atrial beats, wouldn't you say? Mm -hmm. Yes. So uh, what do you think this is then? When there are more Vs than As, we have reviewed in this conference previously that there are generally only two possibilities. Uh, I mean, more Vs than As, it could be like idioventricular rhythm. Right, or VT. I mean, this or is VTAC, pretty fast, right? It could be VT. It's not like white complex, it's narrow complex. It is, but it's a baby, remember? Although the axis mm -hmm. is relatively normal. And I'll, I will just tell you for the sake of discussion, this is the patient's normal QRS axis. Mm -hmm. So then what else could it be? So when the V rate is faster than the A rate, The other thing we worry about is jet, right? Jet, yes. Right, so it's an important rule that when the ventricular rate is greater than the atrial rate, 
it is uh, oftentimes the diagnosis is jet. And so mm -hmm. I think in this particular patient, the answer was jet. What's interesting about this patient is that this, this tracing occurred many, many, many days after surgery, like three weeks after surgery. So very unusual to have jet so far out from surgery, but in fact, that's what the patient had. So one of many arrhythmias this complex patient had. So again, you want to look at the, there's no relationship, right? If this were AVNRT, then the A should be falling basically on time with the QRS in every single beat, which it's not. And as you astutely pointed out, there is not a consistent relationship between the A's and the V's in this tracing. Okay. All right, this is a tracing. Um, this is a tracing that was sent to me from a former fellow former attendee of this conference. Hi, Dr. Pass, just wanted a second opinion on a tele strip. There's a two week old baby who I was consulted on for a murmur, the echo was normal. The NICU thinks he had an SVT episode to a heart rate of 300. They didn't get an EKG and sent tele strips that are hard to tell, but it looks to me like long RP tachycardia and his heart rate came down after vomiting. This is the tracing. Welcome to my world of how easy it is to see these excellent tracings <laughs> that are sent to you. This will happen to you in your career. Um, why don't we ask uh, David Barris if you agree with this former fellow's interpretation. So this fellow is making a distinction between SVT and um, long RP tachycardia. So do you have any thoughts on what this is? Um, yeah, I mean, it's a kind of a poor quality tracing. Um, so trying to make sense of it here. I um, appreciate is, your falling back on that. That's good. I like that. Um, otherwise, it is a terrible it, tracing. It does look like the heart rate is, a, is approximately 300 beats per minute, at least the ventricular heart rate. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'm just kind, trying to kind of piece together P waves um, on here. And I do feel like I'm able to appreciate... Um, um, some P waves that are happening. It looks to be after the uh, QRS complex. Um, and again, kind of tricky, but I would say they look to be about two boxes after. Um, mm -hmm. So I think I would agree with the assessment that um, there's an RP interval more than 70. Um, more than 70 milliseconds. More right. than 70 milliseconds. Right. So I agree with you. I mean, it's very hard to tell on this lousy tracing. Um, and this is not the former fellow's fault. This is the fault of whoever sent the former fellow this tracing. Um, but maybe you could make out a, a retrograde P wave here. This is very hard to tell. But certainly if the heart rate's 300 beats per minute, as we just said with Neha, the likelihood is high that it's SVT. But I think it's important, you know, it's interesting how She's making a, a distinction between SVT and a longer RP tachycardia. So the first thing I want to say is <clears throat> generally when people say long RP tachycardia, they don't actually mean that the R to P interval is greater than 70 milliseconds, although that's how we've been using it here. When they say long RP, they mean very long. We're talking about the diagnosis of PJRT or the permanent form of junctional reciprocating tachycardia where the RP interval can be 200 or 250 milliseconds. In this conference, we use the term RP interval, long RP to denote the difference between an RP less than or greater than 70 milliseconds. So I, I think that what the fellow, former fellow is saying is that the RP interval is greater than 70 milliseconds, therefore she believes it's ORT. But remember, ORT is a form of SVT. We don't use the term SVT in this conference because I think it's sort of a, a general term for everything. Um, but really, SVT, you know, this is just one form of it. So I'm not sure I understood entirely why the former fellow was distinguishing between the two of them, but they're both SVT, whether it's ORT or some other form of SVT. But uh, the bottom line is uh, we are in agreement with the former fellow. This is probably some form of ORT. Okay, 
This is a photograph uh, that was taken by uh, Dr. Lawalia. This was his, her exact quote. He pulled it out. He pulled it partially out. This is a Medtronic link device that we placed three weeks earlier. So I'm going to ask, uh, let's see here. Actually, Grace Kong. So Grace, you're in the emergency department and this is what you come upon. <laughs> It's terrifying. <laughs> it's a little terrifying. <laughs> I agree. Uh, what would you do in this uh, circumstance? Um, I would get an X-ray. Okay. Um, IV antibiotics. Now, why would you need an X-ray? Um, <laughs> Can't you tell what's going on? <laughs> I guess I would be curious if the um, the wire was still attached to the device. Now wait, this is a link device. Oh, do you know a what a, do you know what a link yes, yes. device is? Like okay. a loop recorder. Oh, it's a loop recorder, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Oh, so it doesn't have any wires with it. No wires, no. <laughs> um, I guess we can pull it out. That's exactly <laughs> what uh, Dr. Lawalia did, and in fact, it's in this uh, red bag here. <clears throat> here it is. Thank you, Neha. <laughs> um, yeah, so what about the idea of just pushing it back in? Why would we not do that? Uh, infection risk. Yes, very <laughs> substantial. So, um, yeah, when you have a, uh, so this happens rarely. Uh, in this particular case, we believe that it occurred because the patient who was a small child was, uh, we believe, was potentially uh, touching the area. Um, despite it having been covered pretty aggressively, at least initially. Now, um, the problem is that once you have an infection, well, first of all, once the device is outside of the body, it has to come out because there will never be a way to clear this infection as long as there's a foreign body here. Um, so it had to come out. And so Dr. Lawalia, with great bravery, pulled the device out. She was quite excited by that, as was I, since I didn't have to do it. And uh, this redness here, which is some local irritation and infection, resolved really immediately within two or three days on antibiotics. Uh, it, the whole thing got better. In general, when you have a device infection, removal of the device will clear the infection with the addition of antibiotics 100% of the time. And you will never be able to clear the infection without um, removing the device. So... Um, now we have to figure out how to put one back in that won't be susceptible to this type of uh, problem. So, all right. Interesting things you see on call. All right. In keeping with the theme of Neha, this is the thumb of Neha right here. Uh, what is this rhythm in a newborn? Why don't we see uh, what we got here on the line? We have. Uh, why don't we go back to cert to actually Jenna's here. Jenna, Ke Jenna Keelan, how are you? Hello. So, what do you think All this right. uh, rhythm is? Uh, you can use Neha's thumb as a marker <laughs> here. <laughs> Not even my thumb. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So, um, obviously, this is very bradycardic for a newborn. Um, and if you're looking even just the so it looks like the pr interval um, is very prolonged um, but it looks like it is um, consistent between beats i don't think that it's um, getting progressively longer um, mm -hmm. and then sort of after the t wave it looks like there may be another p wave that follows it mm -hmm. um, so it may be um, two to one block. Okay. Um, now, generally, when we say two to one, what we normally mean is that the. So what would is what type of two what two to one block? When we say two to one block, is that uh, is that uh, first degree, second degree, or third degree block? Two to one block. Second degree. Second degree. Is it Mobitz one or is it Mobitz two? Um, you, um, it is, I, I guess you can't tell. 
Right. That's correct. You can't tell uh, without uh, an intracardiac line unless you had a His mm -hmm. catheter in place. Now, in this particular case, however, so generally when someone's two to one, the P to P interval is fairly fixed, right? Um, mm -hmm. Or, you know, you're in, let's say you're in sinus rhythm, but only every other beat is conducting. Mm -hmm. um, is this P to P interval uh, regular? No, it is not. It is not. So how would you describe this then? And in fact, are the second <laughs> yeah. P waves similar to the uh, presumably conducted P waves? They are, they are pretty similar. They might be slightly different, but like the axis looks the same. Let me just confirm that in all the leads. Um, they may be slightly different. Yeah, I think they are slightly different. If you look, for example, in, um, well, look in this lead, V5 in the rhythm strip, I think you mm -hmm. would agree that this, this P wave is kind of small, the so-called sinus P wave compared to this P wave, a little bit mm -hmm. broader and a little taller. Mm -hmm. I agree, it's a bit subtle. It's not exactly jumping out at you, but these are not the same P waves. Yeah. So how would we describe this then? Yes, so then I would describe this as um, uh, non-conducted PACs um, mm -hmm. in the setting of a baseline EKG with, P with first degree heart block. Right, so, so another way of saying that would be that this is actually atrial by Gemini, right? Mm -hmm. Every other beat is, has this uh, in the setting of first degree heart block. Is there anything else about this uh, ECG that is uh, worrisome to you? Um, so there is a left axis deviation. Um, a left axis deviation. In a newborn, which is very abnormal. Um, Anything Q, else? Yeah, the QRS is wide for a newborn as well. Um, That's like, right. So this baby mm -hmm. has a lot of conduction disease, right? Yeah. We have a left axis. We have a wide QRS, some kind of interventricular conduction delay. We have um, first degree heart block. Should a in an in a patient who is otherwise healthy, should this uh, P wave should this PAC conduct? Um, it probably should, given how it doesn't look like it's falling, you know, in right. what should be the refractory period. Exactly. In fact, this, uh, if we just look at it, it's, uh, it's basically a rate of about 100 beats per minute after the last QRS, right? Mm -hmm. So this beat should certainly conduct if the conduction were normal. So this patient actually had very severe conduction disease. So if you saw this in a new board, what sort of workup would you do? Um, I would certainly get an echo. Um, okay, that's good. Good answer from the non-invasive imaging <laughs> fellow. <laughs> Kenan yes, and Jennifer an Cohen and, and David, <laughs> David Ezon have been training you very well. Uh, but uh, let's assume for the sake of this discussion that they are normal. Um, so, um, in terms, I would check for, um, if there's any like maternal history of, um, like lupus. Okay. So um, the mother tells you, I don't even know what lupus is. I've, <laughs> I've, uh, I am, uh, I do not have lupus to my knowledge. Do you believe her? I'd probably have her Rho law antibodies checked. That's correct, because mm -hmm. a lot of times uh, women are diagnosed for the first time with lupus in this setting. They do not have any, they may be completely asymptomatic. So you would certainly test the mother for lupus. Um, very common that uh, you will make the diagnosis based on the EKG of the infant. Um, what other diseases in the mother could cause this? Um, she says to you, I don't have lupus, but do you have a lozenge? My mouth is a bit dry. <laughs> like Sjogren's? Yes, uh, you could have Sjogren's mm -hmm. disease. <laughs> <laughs> that would be uh, another cause of uh, conduction disease, yes. Um, and um, anything else you would test in the infant? Um.
I mean, I guess you could test for like neonatal lupus markers. In yes, the you could look for that. Unusual, but certainly not beyond the realm of possibility. Uh, mm -hmm. What else could you look for? Um, I mean, w I would ask the mom if she's taking any um, medications. Um, so if the mom was on maybe digoxin or... Okay, yes, the mother could be taking <laughs> some digoxin. She felt a little sluggish that morning, <laughs> took some dig. Um, you know, you also would look for potential myocarditis, unusual in a mm -hmm. newborn, very rare, but not unheard of. So you would probably do like a troponin level in the infant or something like that. But this uh, patient would need a pacemaker for sure, unless you could identify a reversible cause. There aren't too many in the newborn. So, um, so this is a very worrisome uh, ECG and you can see why Neha rapidly took a photograph and didn't even edit her thumb out of it. She was so concerned that I see it right away. Okay. Dr. Fast, could um, yes. congenital hypothyroidism do this Yes, too? I believe it could actually. Mm -hmm. uh, hypothyroidism could, yes. Thank you, Perna. Okay, here's a text I received from Cirque. I believe I was sitting on the beach when this tracing came in. This is Cirque. Of course, Cirque, I knew it was you, but thank you. I have a telly and EKG I wanted to ask your opinion about. Patient in the PCICU is a three-month-old with heterotaxy, AV canal, mildly unbalanced to the left, pulmonary atresia, L-loop ventricles. This is the tracing that... Uh, Dr. Babia sent to me. It's a very interesting tracing. Um, you know, I so enjoyed that conversation I just had with Dr. Keelan. I think I'm going to ask her again if she's still on the call. Did she leave us? I think she left I'm us. I'm here. Oh, you're there. Okay. <laughs> so, Jenna, what do you, uh, how would you explain this? What is going on on this very interesting tracing? Poor Cirque, he's a first year fellow and he's forced to deal with this very difficult <laughs> and unusual tracing. Yes, so it looks like um, kind of a quarter way through it, the um, QRS uh, changes. Mm -hmm. um, the rate looks like it's, let's see, kind of similar. Um, I'd agree with that two. statement, yep, I agree. Um, and sort of in the second half, it seems as though um, there are P waves before every QRS. What about um, in the first half? Yes, also. Um, okay. So it appears and... almost like the patient is in sinus rhythm the entire time, right? Mm -hmm. And yet there is this curious change in the QRS, which the ever astute Dr. Babia noticed immediately. Mm -hmm. and was concerned about appropriately. Um, what do you think about the vital signs? Do they cause you any concern? Um, so it looks at the bottom, the respiratory rate is 30, the blood pressure is 99 over 55, and doesn't look like there's any change in the um, blood pressure with the change in the QRS complex, nor All the right, We have a nice robust blood pressure and our mm -hmm. SAT, our plethmismography looks very nice and clean, no, ch no changes. So how can you possibly explain this unusual mm -hmm. thing? Um, so potentially it could be twin AV nodes. Yes, it is. And let's talk about that. Good guess. Good, good informed answer, I should say. Mm -hmm. So this is, to my knowledge, the first paper that has, that came out to describe this phenomenon from my very good friend, Mike Epstein, back in 2001, in which they, in Boston, identified a group of patients who had AV reciprocating tachycardia involving what they referred to as twin AV nodes. And I just will bring you to the fact that the most common anatomical finding was AV discordance, SLL or IDD, with a malaligned complete AV canal in five of seven patients. Look how Dr. Bibia today was able to 
make this diagnosis, same exact diagnosis, heterotaxy, AV canal, unbalanced. And way back in 2001, Dr. Epstein, Dr. Walsh and colleagues, malaligned AV canal, AV discordance. So that is in fact what this patient had. This is a very nice tracing from that paper. This is atrial extra stimulus testing, uh, 500 280. Um, and what we see here is, is they put in the extra stimulus and we go down node one, and then we're coming back up node two, and the, uh, down node two, rather, I should say. So we're blocking in, in uh, node one and then coming back up going up and then down. And so now we're going down uh, AV node two, creating QRS number two, and presumably going back up through AV node number one. So this is a nice demonstration of how on the left side of the screen, we're going down the AV node in through one manner, through AV node number one, and then tachycardia, we're going antigrade through AV node number two, and retrograde through AV node number one. And uh, so just as in this, so this is different in that we're in tachycardia, so I'm sorry, paced rhythm and then tachycardia, but very similar to Sirke's demonstration here in sinus rhythm, we're able to switch between the two. So this is a very unusual, rare finding, um, but uh, a nice example of uh, twin AV nodes. So it's a quarter of the hour, so I think we should stop now. Uh, thank you all very much. Uh, this was an interesting, uh, definitely an interesting uh, group of tracings. And thank you for all the interesting tracings that we could all share together today to discuss together. So see you soon in a few minutes at sign out. Bye-bye.